menstrual leave. What is it? Why is it? How does it work? Why does it matter? Oh, I'm so excited to talk about this. Before we get started, please make sure to like and subscribe so that you can send this video um, to your organization, to HR, to your DEI rep, and when they get it, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, a lot of people are really about this menstrual leave thing. Maybe I should give it a closer look. So like and subscribe so that, um, and you know, you get you get educated about, you know, why, why not just menstrual leave, but really living in alignment and awareness of the four menstrual phases that are happening to you all the time can actually shift you to pain-free, PMS-free, and um, regular length cycles. And if you're hearing this, you're probably one of the people who need that because apparently 84.1% of people who menstruate experience menstrual disorder. So uh, let's not, let's normalize not experiencing menstrual disorder. How about we flip that statistic and make it that 16.9% of people experience menstrual disorder. And that's because they have something acute that really needs the doctor's attention. All this other stuff, avoidable. Yes, 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 yes. If you wanna know how or why, then stay tuned to this channel. That's why we like and subscribe. Okay, here goes. Menstrual leave, number one, the name, awful, awful. So menstrual leave is the term for the allotment of three days, of up to three days, for people who are menstruating to be in home office or to be out of office, but paid for their time away because they are giving their body the rest that it needs, that because they are experiencing pain or complications in some way as a result of their menstruation, okay? That is the standard of what menstrual leave is. It is something that is triggered or activated as a result of pain. And many times, many times, people need to actually show proof of their pain through a diagnosis like PCOS or PMDD or fibroids or endometriosis. If they can't show that proof, it means that they may not get access to menstrual leave. Okay, that is just the understood definition for menstrual leave. Here's the problem with that. Number one, something that is described as a leave typically connects to and is describing a once in a lifetime, very rare circumstance, like the loss of a loved one. That is called bereavement leave, like pregnancy, that is called pregnancy leave. Like becoming a parent, that is called parental leave. But you see, menstrual leave is not an exceptional circumstance. It is not rare. It is not something that happens once in a lifetime. It is something that happens roughly every 28 days. That's pretty consistent. Something that happens on a, on a pretty much monthly basis is not exceptional. So that's the first problem with the name. It suggests that it's exceptional. And with a name like leave, it suggests that it's optional. The leaves I just described, bereavement leave, parental leave, pregnancy leave. We will often see movies and TV shows that show the woman who's working, you know, she's the detective. And they're like, hey, you could, you could pop any day. You could have the baby any day. And they're like, yeah, but I'm not having the baby right now. And this case has got to get solved. They are electing not to use pregnancy leave, even though they are pregnant. That suggests, leaves suggest, hey man, you just lost your wife. You need to take some time off. I got to work through it. It's easier if I work through it. That's suggesting it's optional. That's suggesting that leave is optional. But you see, this thing that's happening in our body that many of us have come to realize is happening and that we have put it, you know, we've, we've underscored that this is something that needs attention. We've underscored that it needs attention because of, because of being in pain. But actually, this restorative moment that happens to every person born with a uterus who is menstruating, this time of restoration 
is very specifically set up for us with the expectation that we, that our whole lives are dedicated to helping our body restore. This is a physiological happening event. Very, very, um, not traditional, what's the word? Expected, normal. It is a normal thing that is happening from our body's perspective. The people who are born without a uterus, many of us know them as men, but you can identify however you wish. They live with a 24 hour hormonal cycle. So they get everything that they need, including restoration, including rest, orative, restorative time when they go to sleep at night, because it finishes that fourth part, that fourth phase of their hormonal cycle finishes at night when they are sleeping. The body expects itself to be allowed to be stimulation free. It lowers its energy level so that it can restore itself within. It can put all of its energy focusing on restoring its physiological needs within. It's not worried about alarms going off, interacting with others, exchanging energy. None of those worries are taking place. It's not worried about being fed rich food that requires more, um, more digestion, more digestive energy needed. It's not, it's not expecting to do any of that. It's expecting to take care of itself, to restore itself so that it's ready for the next 24 hours. Well, the same thing is happening during those first three days of our menstrual phase, the fourth phase of the four menstrual phases, the final part of our journey over the 28 days, the finishing part, the time of expression. Our menstrual lining is expressed from our body. It's the cleanup after the concert. You know, we plan for the concert, we load in all of that, oh, we're gonna do something, that energy, that's in the phase that follows this one, that beginner's energy, that energy of beginning, because we've cleaned up and we've, and we've gotten ready. We've restored ourselves to be ready to do this thing again. Okay. So your body expects it to happen. And as one of our members in the collective described it before she was aware of what was happening physiologically, she called it her Red Bull days. She didn't drink Red Bull for her 20, for most of her cycle. And then the day of her period, she would have to pound Red Bull to keep her body functioning at the level that she needs it to function so that she can get through her day because her body level was so, her energy level was so low. It's low for a reason. It does not expect to be functioning for the outside world. It needs its interior time. It needs its restoration. Our hormonal cycle, uh, the same cycle that's happening to the people without uterus, for those of us with a uterus who are menstruating, it needs, it's protracted. So everything's longer and it's taking place over 28 days. And so that night of sleep that restores the body for the people born without a uterus is our three days of restoration. When we give our employees, our CEOs, when we give the people in our organization that time to restore, which might look like home office, when our people are instructed, make sure to schedule tasks that are very, very easy, that don't require a lot from you because you need to let your body restore. You need to let it do what it needs to do and you need to give it as many opportunities to disconnect from the world so that it can find its wholeness, so that it can come with full energy into the world in the following phase, if you want that effect. And by the way, when people do restoration during their first three days of their cycle, whether or not they're in pain, their body gets to restore. And like a slingshot, their energy goes back to shoot forward with so much more energy than it would be if they never got the chance to let their body restore. The same opportunity that we give if we don't have a uterus, that we give ourselves every night when we go to sleep. We would never let somebody go through their day if they had to do an all-nighter before. We'd probably say, why don't you go home and restore? Yeah. It's happening to every single one of us who are menstruating. And when we invest in that time of rest, the next cycle, we have people showing up in their 100% because they're not trying to reclaim and restore themselves 
in the other phases because they didn't get what they needed at the time when they were supposed to get it. Think of somebody who is um, on a bike, riding the bike, and they get a flat tire. And they're trying to fix the flat tire while they're still on the bike. They're, they keep pumping more air in that flat tire to keep the bike going. If they just got off the bike and fixed it, it would work. Optimal performance. And then let's say the tire goes flat every 28 days. Well, they know that the tire is going to go flat, so they fix it. And they give it what it needs, and they, they know what's going to happen, so they can prepare for it. They make sure that on their route, they are in a place that is safe, that is comfortable for when the tire breaks down. They can be strategic about what happens with that tire so that when they are riding the bike, they can show up 100% on that bike ride. I keep giving you metaphors because one of the biggest arguments against menstrual leave is that, well, if people who, who are born with a uterus have menstrual leave, then people born without a uterus should also get those days off. They don't need the days off. Their tire does go flat. It goes flat at the end of every bike ride that they take and they refill it. They don't need this time. And by the way, the time that is spent in restoration is more than made up for in the following phase, which I call soldier phase, which biologically speaking is called follicular phase. It's more than made up for because we are physiologically set up to do things more quickly. We have more energy. All of our senses are on fleek, so we have a higher attention to detail. There are tasks that we get done in a phenomenal way in the phase that follows the time of restoration, which I call priestess, which we know as menstrual phase. When we, those can affect so powerfully when we're not handicapping them by not giving ourselves the wholeness of the preceding phase. So number one, I've said number one like seven times. First, change the name. It's not menstrual leave. And in fact, by continuing to use that name, we are continuing to fuel the argument in uh, that is against having it at all because it sounds optional. Number two, the three-day restorative, which is what it should be called because that's what's actually happening. The three-day restorative should not be limited to those who are experiencing complications with their menstrual cycle. It should be a non-negotiable expectation of every employee at every level in a business because every person's body needs it so that they can show up 100% according to how they are physiologically set up to operate. Let's not try to override what we are. Let's embrace what we are so that we can impact in a way beyond our wildest dreams. And I get to see it every day. And lastly, let's make it okay to take time for our rest. Let's not punish each other. The people who I see coming out the hardest against menstrual leave are people who menstruate and people who are born with a uterus. They're the ones who are the most, who, who throw the most shame on people who are trying to make this happen. It's not an uncommon phenomenon that we come down the hardest on ourselves. It happens racially, it happens in social class, it happens gender, you know, along gender lines. But we don't have to continue that way. We don't have to look at things as having two sides. We can just support each other and support and encourage our innate givens, our innate strengths. Because baby, we were born this way. That's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's quite majestic. Wishing you joy, ease, space, and grace.